Michael Pope. Mike. Yeah, Pope I'm, I, I'm, yeah. yeah this is Troy uh, Taylor with the Championship Football Coaches Clinic podcast, sponsored by Reps Virtual Reality, First Down Playbook, Rack Coach, Tip of the Spear, the Top Hopper, and Sports Workbook. And we have a treat. Uh, today because I asked Coach McNally a few months ago who was the best coach that he ever coached with and he told me Mike Pope and then he started naming names like Mark Bavaro and Jason Witten and I was blown away so I got a hold of Coach Pope Coach McNally called him and we have him here today so Coach Pope thank you for coming on uh, Coach tell us a little bit about yourself and and where you're from Coach First of all, Jimmy's eloquent words about my ability as a coach is not going to be debt relief for him. He still owes me. So I'm not canceling the debt because of his his uh, oracle type vernacular to try to get me to be a better coach than I am. I was just a hardworking guy who, who really loved the game. And, uh, and I, had, I had a lot of people uh, contribute to what I was. And, and it, it never was who I was. It was always what I was. So. And so what I was was trying to be a good coach. Uh, I grew up in North Carolina, a uh, little town south of Charlotte. Uh, played high school football, of course, and had uh, my mentor, for, uh, probably my earliest mentor was a high school coach who's no longer with us, but uh, named Danny Williams. And uh, he was he was like a father to me, like a lot of us have had growing up. You know, we had somebody that was, like, uh, that was really, really good at what they did. And uh, so I learned a lot from him. He corrected me when I was going the wrong direction. And, and, uh, and so I ended up getting a scholar college scholarship, uh, played at Lenore Ryan, uh, was on the national championship team as a freshman. And uh, we went, played the national championship, small uh, division two type football the next year and uh, didn't win the second one. But uh, I graduated from there and played a year in the old world football league. There've been a lot of springtime football leagues going to the, that have been bad investments and and uh, a lot of guys walking around with artificial knees like me because they played in that league but i played a year and then uh, the league folded uh the next year so I, I took a high school job really late in the year and late late in the in the summer and i coached uh, two years in north carolina in high school and went to jacksonville florida uh, opened a high school down there wilson high school in jacksonville with uh, with bob williams danny's brother and, uh, and we went to the state championship twice in a row. Couldn't beat Carl Gables. Uh, and then I went to uh, Central Florida and uh, coached for a year. Uh, and, and then uh, in Florida State as a graduate assistant. And uh, on that staff at Florida State, uh, uh, it was Bill Parcells, Dan Henning, Don Bro. Uh, all, there, were, there were eight of us on that staff. And all eight of us, I think, except maybe one, uh, ended up in the NFL. And Joe Gibbs had just left there as the offensive coordinator. And we, left, we lived in kind of on the same block in Tallahassee. None of us had any money in those days. We were just starting. And uh, uh, Joe Gibbs was the highest paid coach on the staff as the offensive coordinator other than the head coach. He made $23,500. So you can, you can imagine the rest of us, the rest of us what we made. But, but, but Florida State in those days was throwing the ball a lot, you know, and throwing it better than anybody else. Uh, the head coach there was Bill Peterson, and he had a lot of influence from the West Coast, uh, San Diego offense, you know, and spent a lot of time uh, learning what the, what the passing game was, was like. So uh, we, we won a lot of games by basketball scores, you know. We, we were good on defense, but not good enough. And uh, we and so we, we played in the first Fiesta Bowl game ever played out in 1970 uh, out in, 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 uh, in, Tr- in, in Carlstad uh, in, uh, 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 in Phoenix. And, and lost, uh, I think it was 40, 45 to 41 to Danny White and the Arizona State well, Arizona State team. So it was, a, it, was, it, was, it was a track meet, really, more than a, a football game. But uh, anyway, so I got a lot of good influence from those, all of those people. And then uh, when, uh, when, when Bill uh, uh, came to the, to the Giants as the head, as assistant coach from New England, uh, he uh, – and he, when, when, when Bear Bryant retired at Alabama, uh, Ray Perkins uh, was the uh, head coach at the Giants. And uh, he had gotten their program righted. The Giants were, were struggling in those years. And, and Ray came in and, uh, and uh, as a player, the, the players were both scared of him and admired him because he told them he'd fire them all. He didn't care. He was, he was there to win. So he had a tough start, but he got the program going, got it turned around, left and went to Alabama. 
and uh, George Young named Bill Parcells as the head coach, and I, I was the early early staff member of Bill's staff there. Right. And, yeah, so I I had a book by Coach Peterson. It's probably one of the best books for a coach to be a head coach. I don't know if you, you've ever seen it, but what what was it about him where he was able to get all those coaches on the same staff? I mean, could he just? Well, as I said, he he uh, he he was. He, he was the king of the molly props. You know, he'd, he'd say things like, son, you can't do that. You'll have a suitcase. He meant a, a lawsuit, you know, he said a suitcase. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, he, but anyway, he, he was, a uh, he, he was a, he was a, a more, more like an organizer and a principal in a high school or a big high school, you know? So he kept, he kept tabs. He used that telephone all the time to find out who were the good young coaches. And, and of course, uh, but a lot of people in the bad weather would like to come to Florida and even, even more so today. So, uh, it, it was easy to attract, at least to get a visit for people to come there, particularly if it's eight inches of snow on the ground in Buffalo, you know, you could get a, you could get a coach from the Northeast or Midwest. Uh, and, and, and of course, a lot of them came through that San Diego relationship out there on the West coast because, uh, bro played there, Henning played there, to, uh, Joe Gibbs coached there. So once, once he got that stream started of getting influence from the West coast, then, then it was, you know, it's like, it's, it's like you get your reputation by who, you know, sometimes, you know, not what you do. So, so they, that, that started that going. And, uh, and then uh, the, as, as the years went on, uh, they, they grew because in those days, Florida state was not in a conference. It was, it was an independent, but yeah, we were playing Alabama. So it's occasionally Auburn, Georgia tech, uh, uh, I think we played Georgia sometime during that time, Miami, and and and, and played a lot of schools, uh, you know, that weren't that weren't even in the Southeast to get a schedule. And there's 48,000 seats in a big old state, big a big state, a big stadium at that time. It's like a giant erector set. It was all metal, and and most of our games had to be at night, so we get get to have a chance to fill the thing up. So uh, so a lot of good coaches came through there uh, during those early early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and uh, and they all, as I said, all of us ended up in, a, in, in that staff. Almost all of us ended up in the NFL. Yes, sir. So, so when was the first time that you heard about Coach McNally or met him, Coach? Hey, listen, keep me out of this. Well, Coach, I'm going to fucking I, hang up. Huh? Or I'm going to hang up if you don't. Yes, I want to know about Mark Paul. I don't want to upset you, Coach. I was just I was asking him about when he first met you, Coach. Do you know who Socrates was? Yes, sir. Yeah, I was, do. Jim McNally was the Socrates of offensive line coaches. Wow. I mean, everybody won. He, he, he couldn't even go to the restroom hardly without somebody. If we, we were at a big clinic or something somewhere, he'd go to the restroom. Somebody would follow him in there. I mean, you know, just to, just to get a couple minutes with him. So, but I mean, he really, and, I, and, I, and I've been as truthful as I can be because it's easy to remember when you tell the truth, hard to remember lies. Amen. But, uh, but uh, but he was, he, he just, and the thing about it is he, he would share that with anybody, you know, I mean, he would, he would, he would talk to anybody that was interested in, he's, he's the epitome of a football coach. And, and, you know, he, he was fortunate to, uh, in some ways to get, get a good thing started when Anthony Munoz was cut, was kind of off the draft list of a lot of teams. And he'll tell you this in the NFL because he had a bad knee, but uh, Jimmy was smart enough to talk to Mike Brown and just drafting him and the great, you know, the greatest left tackle of all time. And, and, but, but he was, he was a good player, but as I said, until, until early in our conversation, until the talent gets to a certain level, that coaching doesn't kick in. Now, if, if he had had some of the guys we had to play with in those years, and when we first started together over in Cincinnati, if he had had to play all the games with one, like one of his worst player there, uh, he'd be driving an Uber and I'd be calling him to see if I could fix his tires. <laughs> so coach off the air, you talked about when you got to the NFL that they had this little seminar that you went to and Tom Landry was there. Can, can you, can you retell that story for the podcast? I know you told me coach, but that was just, that was great. I thought. Uh, that was a long time ago, but I'll, I'll give you the, I'll, not a verbatim, but I'll give you the best recollection I have. Of it. Yes, sir. Uh, we went down to Carl Gables. The uh, NFL had coaches down there and some, some, uh, they're coming out of college, as I said, because the biggest fear when I first entered the, the, the league was gambling, you know, they were scared to death of gambling because it had ruined some college programs and, 
and in basketball, you know, it had their era with it. So uh, they, they had us to come down there and to get some advice from some of the established head coaches in the league so that we wouldn't make mistakes and, 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 and get involved with the right kind of people. In other words, the image of the NFL was one of the most important things for anybody coming in the NFL or if you were working in the NFL. You know, it's common sense where they did not want you to be hanging out, you know. And so uh, I sat beside Coach Landry, and uh, and I, I said, Coach, uh, I, I don't want to badger you with a lot of questions about what it takes to play in the NFL. I said, I think I get a little bit of a picture of that. But but I said, what, what would be your advice to a young coach coming in the league? And I said, and what kind of players? I said, not not what kind of coaching, but what kind of players are you looking for? And he said, well, coach, he said, uh, do you know who Mr. Ed was? I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, I said, yes, sir. He was a talking horse. He said, well, let me tell you, you could take Mr. Egg over to Louisville, put the best jockey on him, put the best colors on him, watch him down every day, train him, put the best trainer you with him that you could possibly find, put him in the derby. Guess what's going to happen? He ain't going to win. You know why? Because he's not good enough. He said, so until coaching reaches a certain level, excuse me, until players reach a certain level, coaching's not going to kick in. He says, you can't coach a rock. He said, players have to have, they have to have the equal opportunity to compete against the other team. Now, which team is better? That's why you play. You decide which team is better on that day. He said, but you just can't take inadequate or in, in players and, and play great talent. You, you got to be, you got to have a chance in the game so your coaching can kick in. So personnel, he said, that's what he was getting at. Personnel is a place you start. And he said, in developing your your back back end players, you know, not not your starters. He said, but if they've been drafted correctly, then you should have pretty good starters. Hopefully, at all positions. He said, but but people get hurt in this league. And he said, so you have to have adequate replacements for them. When somebody goes down, the next guy's got to be step, step up. But if there's a tremendous drop off between your starter and the next player, so you got to work equally as hard or Jimmy McNally, this was his, if he had a hat with, with enough headspace on it to say, develop the, your worst players. That's what it would say. Try to develop your worst players. If, you, if you're on the team, if, 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 if the personnel people and the owner put them on the team, they expect you to make them better. But you, so you got to work. So Jimmy, Jimmy spent endless hours with players that were that we we call down the line players. It's not it's not a degradation on the player. It's just that they're 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 they're, they're, they're not a horse uh, like Mr. Ed, nor they're a rock. But <laughs> but they don't have as much talent as Anthony Munoz either. So uh, or or some of the guys I've been fortunate enough to coach. So the the the, the big thing is you got to get those kind of players on your team. And and then you got to work for the players that's, that's, that's in, in the lineup behind it. Who is 12? Who is 13? Who's 14? Who's 15? Who, who are those players that are not those first 11 on your side of the ball? And yeah, Jimmy, coach, Jimmy was, Jimmy was the, the, the very best. Yeah, Coach. And I've been so blessed to meet Coach McNally and be able to meet all you guys that have coached in the NFL. It's just a blessing uh, to be a high school coach in Richmond, Virginia, and have this opportunity and, you know, You've never done a podcast, Coach. So, I mean, there's a lot of questions. If you had people as much money as I do, you wouldn't do one either. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's uh, – everybody wants to talk about duo. And I remember I was watching the Patriots play when Tom Brady still played for them way back, probably 20 years ago. I don't know. And he was handed off inside zone to the right. And it looked like to me the line was blocking inside zone to the left. And I was like, okay, so – like they're handing it off like it's inside zone to the right, but they're blocking inside zone to the left. And once I met Coach McNally, he, he told me that you two develop duo. And that's a big thing on Twitter, Coach. There's a Twitter verse. Coach McNally can coach you up on this. There's all these coaches, and they want to know, is this duo, is it inside zone? Um, Listen, I'll tell you how duo started. Okay. And, and my Pope can trim in. I went to the Giants, and they had a play with three tight ends, okay? And Mike was at the Giants at the time, Fred Hoagland. But it wasn't really duo. It was kind of a bounce play. But they had the three tight ends all blocking down. And then I think when Mike and I got to Cincinnati, somehow we developed that play, and then we, we put it in in the Giants, Uh Another play that we worked out together is scissors. Oh, yeah. And he, Mike was really. That was Tiki's he, play, right, coach? 
Yeah, but it Mike, was, it was every every tailback. It was it was it was on Monday morning highlights. I can tell you. That. Yeah, but the thing about it is, Mike knew the scissors play, and it was just a hand back. You know, the the, the back would start one way, and he'd go the other way over the top inside play, and he'd always say, "Well, we how do we get a guy on the safety, or how do we get, you know, the force player blocked?" And then we decided, "Well, you got to pull somebody," and so. Between duo and scissors, Mike was a key. And then we we went back and forth. And, and anyway, the play has developed over the years with people putting their own little, you know, we only knew it as a play against, uh, you know, with two tight ends, you know, whether in a wing or a fullback leading and all that. And then people started running it from 11 personnel because if they had six in the box, you could run it, blah, blah, blah. So, but it was a play like, like a power, but you didn't have to pull anybody. No, so no. Mike is an expert at that play and he's an expert at the scissors. Amen. So let, let's start with duo coach. Well, I, 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 I think the, 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 the way the game has, has progressed, uh, you don't see many two back teams anymore, you know, it's all single back in the backfield, or nobody in the backfield. But the what they what the the revolution of the, of the play, the, what is called RPOs today, the run pass option duo would have been the start of that first step of the quarterback in the back to an RPO, so that they were reading somebody. But we didn't read duo; we we called it and ran it. But uh, but that that's what the linebacker had to decide whether he what he was going to do. When you doubled the tackle and the guard, both inside or the center, and in some cases for the inside, where, where two people were working, two people were duo, hence the word duo came, from two people blocking the down lineman and then up to the next level. Now, uh, when we put the third tight end in there, if you put the, if you had, if you had two tight ends and they were both opposite each other, you know what's called a balanced, you know, receiver tight end, receiver tight end. When you put two or three of them on the same side, the defense is forced to make an adjustment. So now they got to slide the whole front if they're going to get the third tight end taken care of out there. How are you going to block? Say they hit the whole. Say they hit it wider, or say it's a run pass option. You know, you got so now I you have- got three. Now you got three receivers coming out the same side, and it becomes a, a fake and then a drop back pass. But still, the, the linebackers you're controlling how the linebackers pass fills or run fills are. So if the linebackers step up on those RPOs, what do they do? Pull the ball and throw it, you know, could throw it right over his head. Weak, weak and strong. So uh, the, the, J- Jimmy had the, 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 the play design, drawing the play up either in the dirt or on a piece of paper or on a chalkboard. It doesn't matter. It's, it's the techniques that you use to get to that, to, to the, the, the validity of a duo play. Or as Jimmy mentioned, the validity of a scissors play. You got, you got to have the right techniques. You just can't say block somebody, you know. Uh, and Lomas Brown told me one time a tackle we had at the job. And I said, Lomas, what's your assignment on in the running game? He said, Coach, block the man over me most of the time. Alert, alert exceptions. Now, uh, there not many guys. Lomas is a great athlete, but he didn't have too many assignments. But in, in duo, you don't have too many assignments, but you can only run it against certain fronts. You know, like duo against a bear, a bear, a bear front. You know, the, the double reduced front. In the it's a little harder to do. It's got you can't you can't aim to, to you got to aim at a gap somewhere. So, uh, so that, that's kind of, evident. but the, the thing about it was it hits, it hit fast. You know, it's like, it's like what eventually became the veer, the veer offense, you know, where, where the back just hits up in there with such heavy speed of the, the, the wishbone, you know, where the fullback would hit so fast in there that the linebackers had to make an instant decision, an instant judgment on whether they step up and cover their gap or do they, do they bail out of there and, and, uh, and try to take, take some pass. Hey, 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 let me tell you one thing. We played the Eagles one year, three times in a row. Yep, I remember. We went, to, we went to the Super Bowl, but we didn't lose. We didn't win this game, but we went. And Mike made this adjustment. The tight ends had a tough time blocking the seven techniques. So we lined up a wing, okay, and we put the wing back in motion towards the center and then brought him back, and we had the tight end take an outside release, and he blocked the Sam backer off the ball that followed him like he was going into the flat coverage and the motion tight end had an angle to kick out the seven technique, which you couldn't get when you're on the line. And we called that play kick. 
Mike might not mm-hmm. remember what we called it. We had duo. I remember. I but, remember. But, and, and, and we just kicked the shit out of the Eagles. And it was the first priest. It was the first playoff game. And then we beat uh, the Vikings 41 to nothing. But anyway, I still remember when the tight end on the ball took an outside release. The Sam that mm-hmm. was off the ball went with that tight end. He blocked him. And the motion guy kicked him out. And we had a big fucking hole. The, uh, yeah, I, I, I do remember. Uh, I, I remember the three times we played the Eagles and, 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 and they were, they were a very good team, but the, 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 the way you get into as a tight end coach is a six technique like Reggie white. And, 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 and you say, well, you got to block them. The head coach will say, well, you got to block them. Well, give me a machete or a yeah. bazooka or something. I need, I need some help here. You know, so so the, the the six technique is is difficult to block because he can go in, he can go out. So yeah. your first step could be a wrong step. So what do you do? So I developed a technique, and, and I ended up taking it even to a wider a, a wider nine technique, that the step was 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 outside foot, uh, short short step with the outside foot, so that if he started inside, I could probably knock him. I, 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 he would he would help me with his momentum to take him. Because if you step outside, if you step with your outside foot and he goes here, now you got to completely replace your feet to get him from running around the edge and tackling the guy in the backfield. Because backs, backs, and backfield coaches, as honorable as they are, uh, they're, they're like they're like tackles on a moving quarterback. You know, well, how do you want me to stop him? You want me? To, is he? What if he goes inside? Well, the quarterback's outside. What if he goes outside? The quarterback ran up the middle and he made the tackle. And the coach is good. You grading the guy? You can give him a minus for what? We're trying to be Superman. You get so so you have to you have to take the the avenue of, of the most dangerous, you know. So so I worked really hard with those first steps, and then going straight ahead. So I was never going to miss a guy. I mean, I wasn't going to get all of him if he slanted or stunted. Now that's a six technique. Now hopefully, hopefully, and even in pass protection, when we had to block well, Jimmy, Jimmy, I learned this from him, and because he loved he loved the short set and and, and, and <laughs> jump players. And of course, he had Anthony Munoz too. You know, short Anthony Munoz could have done a three sixty and still blocked the guy. You know, <laughs> but 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 the, if you if you're trying to pass block a, a six technique, you know, you know the guy's going to bull rush you. You know, because he because I he's he's who he is and his reputation, and I'm who I am as a tight end. So so I believed in in jumping and then jumping them as quick as you could, punching them in the chest with your hands inside. Don't put your hands outside. Put your hands inside, and then eventually I migrated to where that's how I did all my blocking. Because you, the, the, I, I always said, and I just probably made, made some, some equipment makers mad. The guy who invented the seven technique had to be a foreign adversary because he was trying to ruin football. Because nobody, nobody blocks six players head up on them straight ahead. That don't happen. I mean, they're always on angles, they're inside or outside shoulder, or they're stunning to one of those two positions. So, so if, if you want to get leg drive, get in the leg room, get in the, get in the weight room. You know, that's how you get your legs strong. But the, 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 I, can, I can understand why you might do that for two or three minutes at the start of practice, you know, so you get off of the synchronization of everybody getting off on the snap count, trying to train the quarterback to make his snap count audible to everybody so they could understand him, whether he was slow or fast or whatever. But, 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 but the, I, I, really, I really always migrate. And Jimmy, 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 I learned this from him, is, is treat, treat the, the technique and the placement of your hands the same way in a block as you would in a pass pick. Now, not if, if you drop, if you pass setting, you know, but I, I never taught a tight end to pass set. Never did. I taught him to cut on three steps, you know, which everybody did to get their hands down. But, but if, if I tried to take on a, a big defensive end with a, with, with a six foot four, six foot five tight end, like Steven Alexander was, and like Kevin Boss was later on at the Giants, those, those guys were really good athletes, but they were not, defensive end blockers you know that, that, that's not what got them in the league but they they, they compensated for that because they had great talents in other places but but uh that if, if i can stop him before he gets started i have a better chance of giving a quarterback a little bit more time and then i got to use what i was drafted for is my athletic ability but moving my feet you know and stay in front of him just don't get run over if you get run over do it late you know so uh <laughs> But but that 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 had a lot of influence on me uh, uh, from from the McNally teaching techniques, and uh, 
Uh, but a six technique is difficult because he could go either way. A seven technique rarely, rarely is a, a word don't use much in football, but rarely does a six I or, or, or seven technique inside technique, rarely does he go all the way back outside again. Because with a seven technique, he usually comes in a four man defensive front with a two or two I technique because they can't both go outside, you know. So, so somebody's got to take the A gap, the six, the six technique has got to take the C gap. So they're taking those two gaps and the linebacker has to fill somewhere else. But, uh, but uh, that, that's a little bit easier. And that's what led to, to, to the kick play because we couldn't block those guys when they got inside. We couldn't run inside. But most of the tight ends in the NFL, and today's even true, true even today, could block a guy on his inside eye on, on an inside run. It's nearly impossible. So, so we wanted to run in that gap because there was a, there was a seven technique. And there was a, a, a one or two technique in there that would do the two. He was going inside. So in the gap responsibility of the defense, if I could figure out some way to kick that seven technique out and the coach said, well, you just got to kick him out. Well, I'm standing still in a three point stance. How am I going to kick him out? You, did you miss, did you misspeak or what? And, and so Jimmy and Jimmy uh, said, well, let's, let's, let's do something. I said, okay, let's, let's give him a running start, you know, so we'll have a big collision. Fans love that. <laughs> and, you know, so he goes over to the weak side A gap. Quarterback heals him, sends him over there. He comes back. We time it up with the quarterback to snap. And as soon as the ball is snapped, now the tackle can do whatever he wants. You know, whatever whatever, whatever the play call was. Well, on kick, it was to create a C gap type run when somebody on the defense was lined up theoretically in the C gap. There's no place inside the tight end to run with the guy lined up, and you got to get the guy out of there. Well, the only way you can get him out is, is to kick him out. So, uh, so that, 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 that enabled us to run in there against a lot of defenses that had good, really good players there that said, you can't do that. You can't, you can't run in there. We got it. We got a guy on the inside half of the tight end. You can't run inside. So now the, the, uh, that, that was the, 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 the kick play. Now what Jimmy's talking about is the scissors play. When we were at new England, Fred Hogan was the offensive line coach. He's, he's aging gracefully down to somewhere in South Carolina coastline. Now, uh, we we had a, we had a running back uh, from Pittsburgh. You know who that was? Yes, sir. Uh, Curtis Martin. There you go. Uh, Curtis was a great runner, but Curtis had vision that that gave him the best lane to run in. Well, the best lane to run in is not always the one you're blocking. <laughs> you know? So so uh, Curtis would take the ball in the backfield on a weak side run and start bouncing back toward across the center, across the right strong side guard. And you didn't know if he's going to go up inside, but if he thought he could outrun the edge of the defense, he would bounce it outside. But I might be blocking a nine technique out because the play was the weak side play that we were faking was a cutoff angle on the backside guard tackle tight end, trying to cut off, create an inside cut lane, but not to come all the way back across the ball behind the tight end and run outside. And particularly when teams started playing weak side force over there with the safety, you know, because now the Sam linebacker was the force guy on the strong side because on the weak side, they were going to try, try to shut off your inside run over there. And they'd, they'd fill the outside lane out there and see gap with with the safety and, and, or stunt to tackle, tackle in the end down inside and scrape the linebacker. Anyway, they had all the gaps covered. That's gap, a gap defense is theoretically the history of defensive football. Somebody has got to be responsible for every gap. As long as the quarterback always has to hand the ball off and somebody has to run in it, they got 11 on nine every play. Because the quarterback can't block anybody and the ball carrier can't block anybody. So they got 11 guys over. The numbers are not equal. They're not equal. So, so what do you have to do? You have to get people going the wrong direction if you're going to get the ball outside, strong side with a nine technique. And that nine technique is the force guy. He's, he's coached, do not let the play outside of you. Make it cut back. We got 10 guys to help you, nine guys to help you inside. Corner doesn't count. So, so we said, well, how can, how can we get the ball out there? So we, we were, Curtis was a really good inside runner, strong player, one of great human beings. And, and if he could get to the linebacker level, he was going to make you some yards. Now the big guys, you know, he wasn't that big of a running back, about 195 pounds. So Fred and I were talking about how can we get the ball out there? So I said, well, this particularly, particularly if it was a six technique, and it was, it's not, not a great play against a nine technique because you lose your force, you lose your force blocker if it's a nine technique. But we ran it some against a nine technique, especially when the defenses started playing four techniques with a nine technique 
to try to stop your weak side run or your inside beer game, you know, inside zone game. So, so, uh, so we, Mike, take we the- invented the F call free release. The tight end took a free release and we pulled that guard. Even I remember it was the play side guard. And I remember that at the giants. Now the, 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 this play, this play was, was, was wall street. I mean, it was wall street against a, uh, a, a nine technique and, 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 and the three technique and a two, and a two eye technique on the weak side and or, or one technique on the weak side and a defensive end. Here's why. Because the center, in order to pull the backside guard and the front side guard, the center had to be able to block back on that guy that was lined up on the guard. And the tighter he was to him, the easier that block was. So we, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy can tell you more of the techniques he thought, but, but what I always felt like when we first started this thing is what, what does the guy do when, when the center tries to reach him? What, what is it? What is the two type two eye technique try, try to do when we try to reach him? First thing he does is try to fight across the block. He play into the block, face of the block and cross the face of the block to maintain your gap. So when we got, when we got that defense, which there was a good bit of the Redskins were playing that defense. The, uh, the Eagles were playing that defense. Dallas was playing it some, but the, all most of the teams we played had a, had a defense, a four man line defense, because uh, the, the three four defense had kind of fallen in uh, out, out of favor at the time. We weren't throwing the ball as much as we are today. But if you could get a, a, a technique where the tight end could block down on a guy, because when he tried to put his head inside, if you're playing the six technique or a six eyes, even better, when you put your head down in there as a tight end with that, that's why the inside step was so factored into all these things. That's why I said the short inside step. If you were playing a head up on me or slightly to my inside, and I tried to put my head down in there, what would you try to do? You tried to keep me from cutting you off, wouldn't you? So he'd try to fight across my face, which would now open a hole down there. And the same thing for the center. If the center's reaching back for a one or two eye technique, what's that guy going to try to do? He thinks he's being blocked back on. He's going to try to cross his face. That's what he's coached to do in most cases, try to go back across the, the face. So we used what the defense was taught and what the defensive techniques were taught to be to use them against them. Because now if we could get this six eye technique or the tight six technique by putting our head inside, if we could get him to fight across our face, now he began to create some space coming down the line of scrimmage. Now, if we had a three technique, the tackle can block down on the three technique. And when you can do that, you can always block down pull, you know, lead post check trap. So, so if the center now could block back on that one technique or two technique, we could pull both guards because the tackle would block the front side technique and the backside and the center would block the backside. So now you create a wall down there. You create a wall of flow. Plus the back is helping you because his first two or three steps are to, to the weak side. So it looks like a weak side play. Now, if, as they do that, they've created a space cavity out there. And if there happens to be a safety down there or a Sam linebacker out there, you got the first guard pulling to account for him. If 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 there's a safety and a linebacker in a kind of a hip technique with the on the on, on the six technique, now you got a blocker. The front side guard blocks one of them. The back side guard blocks the other. Wall Street. And, and, and with the, the action of the back, if if we're going to end up running the scissors to the left, the offensive left, the running back is stepping to the right, and then the ball is handed up underneath. No, it's handed over the top. Over the top. So just yeah. like, just like the Redskins did on counter, like with similar, very similar. Yeah. The the but 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 the 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 back has to have the confidence because you are angle blocking two people that could run right in your backfield if they missed them. The centers and the and the right and the right tackle on the three technique. If you miss those two guys, you know they're gonna run right in the backfield before the back. It takes a little bit of time for the back to make the action. In your case, you said going to the left. He, he has to make an a, a, an action. And he can't take the ball deep in the backfield because you want that linebacker to flow. You want him to see that back cross about behind the guard's butt, at least in the perfect world outside hip of the guard. Get on out there with the ball so you kind of get those linebackers to start moving laterally. Think that, that that's the run. So now he puts his foot in the ground and comes back and he gets behind two guards. If you have that technique we're just talking about, where the tackling tight end, uh, the tackling and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the backside guard can both pull. Excuse me. And so – so now, now you're off and running, and and we we did this I think out in Arizona. We played Arizona card. Tiki Barber was our running back at the Giants. 
There was a hole you could have driven a Volkswagen through on that weak side. We're gonna, we're gonna we had a lot that. of different ways to run it. Ooh. Let me tell you another play that Coach Pope invented. He might remember this. He might not. We used to run two tight ends. Okay, I don't know if we called it ace or solo or what. And people were playing a lot of under defense, under, over, whoever the fuck you want to call it. <laughs> so we would go check with me, G. You know, the G play where you yeah. drop down, pull a guard, blah, blah, blah. And we'd run away from the strong safety because the outside backer to the other side had contain. So the tight end would block down on the five and the tackle would pull and that outside backer would run to keep contain. And as long as we pinned the five technique, there was a huge hole. So remember, we would run check with me to the force, away from the force, all those different options we had. Oh, yeah, yeah. And all we asked the center to do is just scramble block the nose because you didn't have to have a great block because right. it was a real wide play. I mean, right. really run, run, run away from the middle of the defense. Yep, yep. Yeah, and that was so, an unbelievable thing that that we did. And uh, uh, that shit, we, 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 when we played the Redskins and whatever, we made – a ton of yards on that G play. And uh, anyway, that was part of Mike's stuff too. Uh, but, 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 a, lot of, a lot of coaches, the, the particular, the, the less they know about offense, in particular running game, the less they know, the more dangerous they are. Because, because if you tell a guy, you just, you just block him. So well, you got to block him. You, well, that was uh, two, uh, three months after Jimmy taught him how to block him. He, he, he had three months of training of how to block him. You know, the, the step, the hand placement, the, the, the head position, all, all, of the, all those things are factors in good running. Now, I don't think that's the case anymore because there's only a few runs anymore in football with all these one back offenses. And some of them are quarterback runs. Even. They don't even have a back in the backfield. So, so the, 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 the techniques that are involved is what Jimmy was. That's what, and I learned that from him. Uh, you, you got to be finite in what you tell a player to do. And that player is going to be different from the guy lined up beside him, you know? So, so being uh, able to adjust those techniques to the player. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is, cause I want this to be the Mike Pope show. Uh, and I don't want to be sticking my nose in because I, but I did have to, I did want to do scissors, the G play and uh, you know, the duo, but I'm going to leave and I want you to, Finish uh, whatever time you got go because I want you to honor all of Mike. You mean Pope. the time you're taking He's... up of mine right now with this oration? <laughs> right? Listen, coming? this guy's been to six Super Bowls <laughs> and he's won four. I mean, six Super Bowls, that's as many almost as Tom Brady, for Christ's sakes, who's played for fucking 105,000 years. So, yeah, you know, it goes back to our opening comments, you know. You ain't going to win the Derby with Mr. Ed. So okay. getting the right players. And fortunately, after, a, a lot of organizations don't want the coaches to be very much involved in, in the personnel. You know? But it depends. If, if you have a, if you have a, 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 a staff of, of player personnel staff that really knows what you're looking for, but nowadays they change coaches so many times they don't want to get too involved with a guy that can just do one or two things because you know, they change coaches a year from now, and now they don't need that technique anymore, you know. Uh, I've had some good conversations with guys that were great players back in the eighties, Harry Carson type of guys, you know, who were built like a statue of Liberty. Uh, but the t some of those players today wouldn't even get on the field because they can't cover anybody. You know? So the game changes and as the game has changed, but uh, the, what, what's, what's a little bit uh, dispelling for me is the people used to say when I first came in the league and Jimmy first came in the league, uh, a player can't come right out of college and play. You know, he needs, he needs a couple of years of seasoning, you know, particularly quarterback and, and some of those. Now, skill positions, receivers, defensive corners type of thing. We had James Thomas at Florida State with first-round draft choice by the Steelers, and he played right away. You know, Eddie McMillan was on the other side. He went to the Rams, played right away. And that was, that was the team that went to the first to the Fiesta Bowl. So, so those kind of players, those really highly skilled players that are playing space, you know, where they don't have to con combine with anybody or coordinate with anybody beside them. Uh, with, that's what takes the time. The closer the, the closer the players get to each other, the more coordination and the longer it takes them to to learn to play. But you go you go to any schoolyard in, in the country today and watch little kids playing with flags on their belt. What are they doing? 
quarterback's in the shotgun, nobody's in the backfield, people spread out all over the field. Or they say the quarterback can't play right away in the NFL. Well, you go to junior high school, what are they doing? Same thing, spread out all over the field. Go to go to, to go to high school. I watched the Texas State Championship on, on TV the other night. Wasn't anybody in the backfield. Both either team. They spread out all over the field, sideline to sideline. And then you go into college and now you go in. So these guys that are that are playing these positions that that run so if they thought took a lot of time to develop, they're they've been playing this same offense since they were eight, nine years old. So that's why these college these college quarterbacks can come into college, into the NFL right now and play right away because they've been doing that all their life. They some of them have never taken a snap from center. You know, the only thing they ever took was shotgun snap. So some of the things they have to do with a quarterback if they're going to play some under center offense, he's got to get under center and learn to take a snap. That's the first thing. That sounds ridiculous for a pro player to have to do that, but that's what the case is. So, uh, but uh, as I said, uh, Jimmy's waved away. He got, probably got tired to take a nap. <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but we, we we coached similarly because I, I I mirrored him. You know, I I. He, he was he was he was an example for me because I, I I used to think well that that's a pretty good technique well what's the best technique for that player and he 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 really emphasized that so much with his players and we worked together so much with the end of the line players tackles tight ends tackles two tight ends tackles three tight ends you know on the same side or balanced up so uh, I learned so much from him because uh, because he he he's just finitely coaches a position you know. And that's why he has a reputation as he has, and that's why all these line coaches from anywhere and everywhere would give you, would love to have some time with him. Yes, sir. Um, and I asked you about duo, and, and you told me that it's about the techniques. It's it ain't about the play. It's about no, no. execute the play, coach. And all these coaches on Twitter, they get so caught up. Well, is that inside zone or is that duo? I mean, it's the techniques, right, well, coach? It is because duo duo has no option to it. Unless the quarterback just mishandles the ball and misses a dive play, you know the inside zone play. The, the the running back on duo is going to get the ball. Now these these the the, the option that could be that kind of grew out of all this, you know. They said, well, everybody's running inside. Well, how do we get the ball outside? Well, that's that's how the option came, you know. And uh, and and there've been all different kinds of options. But I often wondered if somebody could go into any level of football, probably college, and run the wishbone. Nobody could stop them because they got 100, 185 pound linebackers over ready to play pass defense. You know, <laughs> get you a big fullback and just just keep you just keep keep handing duo off to your fullback first back through the hole. I mean, it's it's almost like the Philadelphia Eagles and you know being able to like when they run that quarterback sneak, coach. I mean, it's almost unstoppable. I mean, why did they allow them to start aiding the runner like that? I mean, well, they were smart. They brought a guy, a rugby coach from over, I think, in England or something. I think it was England. Brought a rugby coach in. And 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 they took his took his training and applied it and and there's they, no way to stop the play. I mean, uh, they're 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 a four down offense backed up on their own five, ten yard line. You know, <laughs> if they need to be, if it, if they can get it to fourth and one, yeah, because I don't think I don't think they stop one time all year, maybe never. I don't know. But yeah. I would say this about that: if you put Reggie White on the nose like the Eagles used to do and like Green Bay did in that bear defense, you know, that forty six defense, I don't know if it works so good against that man. Yeah, you're right, Coach. And that, it goes back to your your theory, uh, you know, what, what Coach Landry told you so long ago. Uh, I mean, but you mentioned something like you called inside zone the veer. I mean, and Coach Zerline, he coached at Houston when they ran the veer, and he got yeah. to the I mean, Coach, what y'all were coaching, Coach McNally and yourself, what y'all were coaching in pro football, did it come from that school of veer offense and veer blocking? I mean, it, well, uh, yeah, I, I can't answer that because I don't know the guys. I, I never was involved in any development out of the veer except the RPO type thing. You know, you, if they if the linebacker stepping up, you know, I had really good tight ends. Always had tight hot, the uh, you know how the hot play. The, you know, they all talk about throwing hots. That yes, came out of that came out of Cincinnati. Because when uh, uh, when when Cincinnati when 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 they were pretty good back in the Boomer Sison days, you know, and they went to the Super Bowl, uh, I don't remember exactly what year it was. <laughs> uh, the the defensive coaches there, when when the uh, when when the quarterback started to hand the ball off inside, and, and and the two strong blitz, the Mike Sam blitz, you know, where the end would, would come down and the bike backer would scrape into the C gap, and the Sam would rush in the nine in the, in, in the nine lane out there, and it's a two strong blitz. Well, if you were paying protection where the guard had to duel Mike to Sam 
or a back in the backfield had to do Mike Sam. You can't be two people. So, so how, what did they, and, and behind that, they usually played a little rotated zone to cover because somebody had to come up and be able to take the first to the flat. And then somebody had to be able to take the hook or curl it had to be the backside linebacker coming over because he's the nearest player that could get to the strong side hook. So what, what they developed when, uh, was when the Mike and Sam came, uh, they just, the, 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 rather than try to drop back and hold the ball and hopefully hold it long enough for him to block the most dangerous of those two guys or the guard to block the dangerous of the, or if they walked the mic up and held him there for a count when the ball is snapped and then dropped him and the Sam came, the guard would be frozen in there and the Sam would come clean and hit the quarterback. Now you can't do that very many times. That ain't healthy. So, so what they decided to do was when the Mike and the Sam came, they would just pop pass to the tight end in that vacancy before the Mike linebacker could get over there because the strong safety had to take the curl. To, he had, they had to take first to the flat because it was a rotated zone. And so that, that became the beginning of the hot term right there. It's a quarter, tight end releases. He sees both the Mike and the Sam come hot, hot, hot. The quarterback hears it. The quarterback knew he might be the one shouting if he wasn't hollering at some other player got him hit the play before. Uh, but, uh, but he, as soon as that happened, it wasn't a big gainer, but, but you just popped the ball in there. Well, if you had tight ends that were big and strong and can run, which there were a lot in the NFL from the Mike Ditka area on, you know, there were big tight ends like that. that weren't threats because that they weren't expecting them to win a lot down the middle of the field on cover two, because cover two was not as big in those days as it, as it grew into being. And there was no cover four at all back in those days, which was four across coverage in the back secondary back then. So once you hit that tight end, the Mike linebacker, excuse me, the, the backside linebacker, the will linebacker coming across the top, he would have to drag tackle that tight end down. Well, if that tight end was big and strong, he could, he, I mean, I could show you, I don't have the video anymore, but I could show you uh, Mark Bavaro dragging guys for 15 yards after they hit him at six yards, you know, and he just drag them just real, real big and strong. Jeremy Shockey is the same way. I had him into Giants. We drafted him and he played really well. So here again, that's Secretariat, not Mr. Ed now. Yeah. Both those guys, Secretariat. So, so if you just get that ball to him real quickly, and of course the tight end couldn't, he couldn't veer back in there. When you first get the young guys coming out of college, they'd want to bend it back in there because it looked yeah. like it's a big hole. But you're running right into the Mike linebacker, so you get three or four yards. That's a, so you had to teach that technique of how you release. You saw both of them come. You didn't have to keep it. It's not a full speed route. You're not running full speed. You're giving a quarterback an angle and a throwing in a target. You give him a good target. He doesn't, it's not whether you're going to break across and he doesn't know and he throws it behind you or you break too wide and he throws it out in front of you where you can't reach it. You got to, you got, you, you got to give him a throw and just a throwing lane right there. Cause all you want to do is get that ball to the tight end. It doesn't matter how deep it is. You know, in those days, you just get it to him right away. And the longer you hold it, the better chance the free linebacker, whichever one of them is free, the Sam and the Mike is going to hit your quarterback or hit him as he's throwing. Them. You want to get the ball out of there where you don't put the quarterback in harm's way. So get it out quickly. And, and the, it doesn't have to be a long pass. Well, that, that, that you still see hots now all over the league because the guys you can't block, somebody, somebody's somebody got to block them. The quarterback and the receiver got to block them or so quarterback and somebody have to block them. And then the shotgun, you know, you don't get there. You don't see as many quarterback hits and because they, they all throw the ball pretty quick these days. But the, the thing about it is if you can get the ball quick enough there, then the guy can be a great runner after the catch. Let him use his athletic ability rather than having to, to use the athletic ability of a running back trying to block two people. You know, you made a great point. You said that it's not a full speed route. Like no, it is a pop pass. The tight end is is going 100 miles an hour, and I mean he's 20 yards deep. You still got to fake an ISO on a pop pass, and like you got to exactly, exactly. Running, talk about that, coach, because I try to teach my players like, dude, you're running 100 miles an hour on an out route that's a bootleg. Like you're gonna run out of bounds before the quarterback even. Even if, like, you, if you were target practice shooting, what would you rather shoot? The still, the still duck, uh, uh, decoy duck, or the one flying 50 miles an hour? You know, just be the best target you can be. And you, but the, the word, the, the, this, this is the, this is a dual problem for teams that, that still do this. Something it was a big problem back then. If you try to get him further down the field, that takes time, and that time is giving that unblocked linebacker to come at the face of the quarterback. Well, even even if he's open. They block the ball. They slap the ball down. These guys six foot six can jump to ten feet. Some of these quarterbacks today could eat, 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 eat could eat off a, 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 bar, a bar stool. You know they're not tall enough. So so you got to get the ball out. So you don't don't let don't let the failure of, of wasting time to get the tight end down the field. 
Don't don't waste that time trying to get a deeper play. This is not a deep play. It's a run and catch play and being an easy target type play. That's what it is. Being and easy target. So the story is moving, and, and now now the quarterback, if if the guy happens to be in his throw, if he's in his throwing lane out there quite a distance away from him, he can throw it around him. But the closer he gets, it's like a cone. You know, the closer he gets, that cone closes in, and he, he, he can put his hands, his, his arm, a wingspan out here. He can even try to throw it around him, he'll knock it down. So you want to throw the ball when there's a good separation between that unblocked linebacker on a hot, an unblocked linebacker and, the, and your target. Yes, sir. Off the air, you talked about Mark Bavaro coming out of college and, you know, you standing up on the table for him, Coach. Can you talk a little bit about that? What did you see in him and, you know, coaching? Well, he, uh, uh, Mark was a unique individual. Uh, I couldn't get him to say anything from anybody. No one can, anyway, he's, he's the quietest, most reserved person. Now I heard he's doing public speaking. I said he must be doing reading off a platform or, or a card or something. But no, he 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 was cold blooded tough. I mean, he was just, and he was a good blocker in college. But uh, he he had some negatives, you know. People were a little uneasy. So we we let him get to the to hundredth player in the fourth round. We took him. He's the one hundredth player in the draft. And then for about five or six years, he was a prototypical tight end, and everybody was looking for a guy yes. like him. Jeremy Shockey came years after him, same way. Prototypical. Had some problems in college, you know. People were a little bit nervous about him. Uh, Ernie, of course, he was the general manager to Giants. I went down to Miami to work him out. They had a big field. They had a lot of great players in the draft that year, and we worked. I worked him out for about 35 or 30, 30 minutes or so. And Ernie, of course, he came running over and says, "You're going to get him drafted in front of us." He said, "Let up, let up. We can see." <laughs> but you know, I mean, I, I did a lot of throwing drills to these guys over the years, but I never threw him a ball to hit him right in the chest. Never threw one to hit him right in the chest. Throw it down by their ankles. That's what. They, that's the third down play they got to make in the game. Throw it on their back shoulder. That's what they got to make in the game. Work on the things that don't get normal reps. And to stand in front of a ball machine and catch a ball is the biggest waste of time I've ever seen. The only thing that should be happening if you if you're in that ball machine, only two things left on earth. <laughs> you, you need. And, and I threw my own drills for a lot, a lot of years. I did some crazy things. I've got about probably I've upwards of 300 different types of drills, and and all of them are about hand-eye coordination. And being able to make Coach McNabb is telling me about the door, Coach, opening up the door. And we were we were, we were going to Minneapolis to play in the old in the old dome up there when when and and when and they had that collapsible roof dome. Remember, caved and the snow caved it in the same year. Mm -hmm. The the spotlights, people I talked to said there's hot spots up in those lights because it wasn't a well constructed dome. And it was, it was, a, it was a flexible dome. And they said, there's some hot spots up there. He said, so sometimes a receiver can be going and be like a, a punt returner or a receiver running with the sun, staring into the yes. sun. They said, these things these things would be so bright, you'd lose the ball. So at the end of practice, Jim Fossil was the head coach. He had a big, big meeting group out there and about 25 yards from our, 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 our dummy barn where they put all the dummies at the end of practice and all the things that were scattered out on the field, ropes and, you know, tapes and all that kind of the equipment guys to put them in there after practice. So Jim was, Jim Fossil was having his press, press conference over there. It's up on a podium. A lot of, a lot of New York press there all the time. Anyway, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of new media there from all different angles. So over on this barn, this little, this little dummy barn over there, there's a hinged door on there with, with, uh, you know, like bar room doors and you just pull them open and put stuff in there and close them. I thought, boy, this would be a good idea. And I don't know where I, – I, I just made up most all of these things. I copied a few, but most all of them I made up. I said, now the sun is in the west, and that's at the end of practice, that's where the sun's going to be. So I told one of the equipment guys, I said, you go over there and you grab that latch on that door. And when I shout now, you jerk it open. And I put one of my players in there in the dark. So when I said now, he jerked the door open. I fired the ball in it, came right out of that sun, right into his face. And, and everybody went through there. And after about – after about one round through there, Fossil sent somebody over there to tell me, you got to quit doing that now. You're running my press conference. He said, all the cameras are filming your dumb drill over there, he said. So, <laughs> and, you know, after practice, one, one year, you know, I wanted to shock them a little bit. So I'd bring the guys up at, when I was up at the New England, or up at New England, I did this. I also did it at the Giants. When at the end of practice, you know, you got all those big trailers right there on, on the field with ice in them, you know. I told him, I told him, a couple of the uh, equipment guys. I said, drag that, drag that big thing of ice over. He said, well, it's all, all, almost all melted. I said, that's what I want. So I'd have the players take their pads and their helmets. They didn't have anything but their pants and nothing on their chest and back. 
I'd make them run by and I'd reach in there with a bucket of water and they came by just as a ball. I had shout now, have somebody else throw the ball. I'd throw that bucket of ice water right on the low part of their back. I mean, it, it, it would send them in all kinds. Of, that was a concentration drill. And, and so I did it to everybody three or four times and throw the ball. If we go to training camp, we had a pool in training camp. I'd make them run, jump off the end of the diving board and catch a ball in the air, you know, while I was going into the water. Uh, so just I, I, in, in Washington, I had I, Stephen Alexander had to be a good receiver. So I put a little swimming goggles about this size right here. Took the helmets off. Story put, about that. put the swimming goggles on, you know. And then then I, I, I put tape across her helmet right at the end of practice because I always did these drills at the end of practice. I'd put tape across her helmet like this so the field of vision was only about this wide right here. So uh, and just all those different kinds of things. And uh, and put the, you know, dip balls in buckets of water and throw it at them. Even if we weren't down, knew we weren't going to be playing in the rain, just keep double the dip ball drill. Balls in the, in, in, in the rain. So when you got ready to go play somebody, you know, it wasn't like, oh, my God, we're playing in the rain. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, and then I just, I just make them up as I go. I like to throw the ball low and behind players because people don't expect you to even catch, have a chance to catch that ball. But there's some, there's all these things have techniques to them. Well, if you turn it all, you see your arms. Like you, you see, the, how, how do you correct that? You got to, you got to turn your hips. So your arm, you, you, you got to rotate like a robot. You, your arms have to stay the same length. You can't catch a ball with your hands in this position. And when you catch a ball above your head and you put a helmet on right here, you got a limit up there of how far you can see. You do this, I'd, I'd, put, I'd make them put, put their hands up and try to catch balls over the head first by, by not lifting their head. And, and then I, I would say, you, it's just like, like shooting ducks if you're a duck hunter or like shooting bow and arrow if you're an, uh, if you're an archer. In order to see your target, you have to, your eyes, the perfect vision is your eyes staying level. Anything else? And I, I grab their head and shake it like that, you know, and you, the, the ball looked like it had fur on it if they could catch it at all. And so I did a lot of things, grab, moving their helmet around, taking my helmet in and stand behind them, putting my helmet. And when they trap your arm, the guy behind you, on, on a lot of tight ends get their staff and stuff out quite often. When, they, when, they, when you start to, start to lift your arm, you, you get this technique right here, arm, arm across here. You come from the outside. So I, I trap their arm here. How do you get that arm free? You can't get it free doing this because this arm is going to be down. This one's going to be up. How do you get it out? You flip your elbow and flip your hand around and you get it out right now. But but you have to practice that. You can't talk about it and not do it. You got to do it hundreds of times. So we do that. We do that sometimes just to, just to hard practice. We're standing over there watching defense or something. Shh, flip your hand and, and keep an elbow in by your hip and just rotate your forearm and you get your hand out. Now your arms can go up at the same time. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about this, you know, when I knew you were coming on, coaching tight ends is probably one of the hardest positions to coach because you got to teach blocking, pass blocking, and catching the ball. So am I right about that, Coach? I mean – Well, you're, it's, it, you're never out of the game at that position, you know. I mean, if, 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 if you're playing receiver out here in space and the corner's off of you 10, 12, 15 yards and you're running an inside zone play or something, you know, you, know, you, you you're not going to have any activity, you know. You're like watching a tennis match, you know, head going back and forth. You know, so so the tight ends are involved almost in every place, some way, shape, or form. Now they they aren't necessarily involved in what's called nows now. You know, whether it's just, if you just grab the ball, throw it out to a receiver, mm -hmm. you stand out there with that un uncovered, basically uncovered. So that, but but almost everything else, the tight ends involved. So you get to work with the offensive linemen, you get to work with the receivers. You can now you can play in the backfield, which we did with our tight ends. We played them in the backfield. We motioned across. And, and, and had them block. We motioned them across. Uh, we're, we're in the Super Bowl game against the, against the Patriots, and they were blitzing us on the weak side, dropping their defensive end to to cover Stephen uh, uh, Stephen Boss. And so we, we we caught on to that finally about the third quarter. So Ron Earhart was of course he said, "Let's just release him down the field and 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 and, and throw him the ball. There's been nobody out there." I said, "We can't do that." I said, "The end's going to grab. He's going to tackle him. If he sees he's releasing, he's going to tackle him." I said, let me motion him across the backfield and bring him back and get him a little space away from that defensive end. Of course, their defensive end was, was, was a defensive end. He wasn't a cover guy. So I got him three or four yards outside the tight end. We snapped the ball 46 yards later down the field. They tackled him. So that, that was a big play in that Super Bowl game because uh, we, we were having trouble getting big plays. You know, we were nickel and diamond, it, but we couldn't get big. They were great defense. And so we, we, had, to, we had to take advantage of, of one guy's skill on offense, uh, uh, Kevin Boss, who couldn't who couldn't block those big defensive ends, and and and, and he, they wouldn't let them off the line if they were blitzing over there. You know, they'd just grab them and hold them, or, or or hit them and knock them off balance and screw up the timing of the thing you were trying to do. So all all those things, 
Now these these things, and that's why I think the the, the, the gray beards around this league for a lot of years kept getting jobs. You know why? Because they had seen almost everything. Now, some of these young guys coming out of college or probably never coached high school, never coached college before, former players, a ton of former players, and I admire them. Uh, I, I, I don't admire their the, the career decision because you know, you're going to work seven months almost without a day off, so you want to do that or not. So, so, so you, you, but, but, but those little things that you learn along the way, you know, you learn something when you're a high school coach. You learn something else when you're – I think – uh, and uh, uh, the best coach that never coached in college or high school in the history of football is Bill Belichick. I mean, he's, he, he started out as an intern, you know, over at Baltimore for, uh, uh, for almost no money at all. And, uh, and, and, but he was, he's the most, he's the most detailed. He's, he's, he's like Jimmy McNally. And he, he never goes into any situation in any game that he hasn't covered. I mean, I mean unless they turn the lights out, he's covered it. Yeah, I think I think Paul Boudreaux, when I had him on here, he talked about coaching at the Naval Academy and coaching with his dad, who is the greatest scout of all time, you know, wrote the first scouting book. And Paul Boudreaux said that his dad is the greatest storyteller. But other people have told me that Coach Belichick is the greatest listener of all time, that he listens. Can you talk about that, Coach? Well, he, he listens to people that he admires. You know, they listen to, to people that could be a model for him. Somebody that can teach him something. He can learn something from. But but he's he's done a lot of this on his own by fitting pieces together. Because f- football is, is is a human has a human element factor in it. You know, it's not it's, it's not something like a like you like a game on the on a board or like you know so mm-hmm. the, things never happen exactly the same way twice or relatively exactly the same way twice. But but a lot of things happen that are similar. And when something happens that is similar. It would be good if you'd been around the first or second time that happened or third or fourth or fifth time. So this is not the first time you've ever seen it. Because when the player asks you, what do I do? You can't give him that dump and up shoulder look. You know, it ain't going to work. You need to have an answer. And and Bill Bill has more answers than anybody I've ever been around. I guess because he's seen it all. He's and been doing it all of his life. He's, his, yeah. They say he was breaking down film when he was five. So I mean, <laughs> I, I I can't answer to that because I I wasn't around him, but but uh, I I do know that he he uh, he he doesn't have a great affinity for the media. I know that. So uh, yeah, he, he, but you know they, they try to try to back in the corner, and he 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 sometimes if they get after him too much, he tries to humiliate him a little bit. But that's all right too. They try yeah. to do that to you when you lose. Yeah. So uh, but but, uh, but he's that 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 kind of guy is that that's an example of a real football guy. Bill Parcells was a real football guy. Bill, Bill seldom Parcells seldom ever had a situation occur that he didn't have an answer for. Now he might have to fit two or three pieces together to get the answer, which we all do, but he could do it very, very quickly. But Bill, Bill was a, Bill Parcells was an entirely different person. Bill Parcells was a motivator. He used to come down to the locker room in the morning, sit down beside of a player, you know, and pull a stool up beside a player in the locker room early in the morning. Well, as soon as guys started walking in the door to come in for the day, they said, Oh my God, what did, what did that player do now? You know, but he wasn't talking to me. He's, he's talking about NBA basketball or something, but they didn't know that. So every time he came in the room, they were hoping he'd pull a seat up beside them because it looks bad, you know. But it, but he that wasn't his that wasn't his purpose. He motivated every player as best he could individually, and he motivated the players that were the down the line players, the players that were struggling. You know, I mean, they were on the team. He was responsible for coaching, and we were responsible for coaching. So you better do whatever you can to get the guy to play better because they'll replace you instead of the player. You know. So, uh, but he was he was really great, a great great motivator. And used every tactic, tech, tech, technique known to man, and that that was that was really his strength was getting the players to play hard. Man, they played hard. Yep. And he did, he didn't he did, he didn't have much sympathy for for players that, that had talent and didn't play hard. And uh, he, he 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 adhered to that philosophy of I see more in you than you see in yourself. You know. Ooh. Yeah. I, I love it, Coach. I mean. Uh, well, I was, I was going to ask you, like, you coached for Tom Coughlin. And, I mean, yep. Tom Coughlin, I, I, did he beat Coach Belichick twice in the Super Bowl? I mean, well, the team he coached did, yeah. They, yeah they, 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 they didn't go midfield. They didn't go midfield and run out to the National Anthem but, one-on-one or nothing, yeah. I mean, do you think because they had coached together and you coached with all those guys, did that well, give him an advantage? I, 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 don't think, I don't think the techniques that we both played hard. Tom Tom was good to get the players to play hard. He was really good to get them to play really hard. 
like Belichick. They, they were very similar in that way. They, they, they motivated the players. They inspired the players. They worked really hard to be disciplined players. You know, we had that uh, uh, Joe, Joe Paterno five minute rule, you know, at the, at the Giants, you know, where you, you, if you came in on the clock, you're late, you know, type of thing. But every coach has their own ways of getting the players to be disciplined. And Tom was a disciplinarian. Uh, Belichick wasn't hardcore disciplinarian. Parcells really wasn't either. He'd let, he'd let some things go a little bit if, 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 if it didn't interfere with the, with the progress of the team. You know, he, he, he wasn't a browbeater about every little detail. Tom was a detail person. And, uh, but the reason we won those two Super Bowls is because uh, Mario Manningham made a catch over the wrong shoulder on the sideline, mm-hmm. and, and David Tyree caught a ball against his helmet. Man, I that, 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 that's that's why we won the game. The fact that we got in the game and got to that situation was attributed to the head coach and all the people working for him. Yes, sir. Uh, it, before we came on air, you talked about being a coach and acting like other coaches. And eventually you have to find yourself and you have to be genuine. And I mean, I've done 140 of these since January. So I've talked to all kinds of coaches. And they all say the same thing. You have to be genuine. So talk a little bit about that, Coach, being a coach and trying to imitate someone else. I think I think you can admire somebody and study someone before you become that coach that's going to be you know, in charge of, of a position or a head coach especially. And the, the day that you start to, to veer away from that person, take, take his strengths that you attributed him for his strengths, take those strengths and apply them to yourself. But the, the, the day that's important that you become use your own techniques and your own imagination and your own will and, and all the things that you have to instill into a team is the second day you become a coach, not the first and the second one. So you quit imitating, quit mimicking people, trying to be like them the second day you become a coach. Don't do that anymore. Mm. Because frauds are the easiest thing in the world. A guy calls you and say, "Give me five hundred dollars, I'll send you a thousand back." You gonna send him the money? No. That's that. That's what trying to imitate a coach and be like somebody else is. It's a fraud. It's a fake. You know. Just you, you got you got to use because those players, uh, you know, they 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 might not be smartest guys on the on, on the math test, but they can they they can find a phony in a heartbeat. Man, who are some of the? I mean, you talked about Coach Parcells, but. And, and Coach Belichick and Coach Coughlin, but Coach, like meeting you and Mike Stock and Bob Sanders and Coach McNally, I mean, these these guys were never head coaches, but y'all are some great football coaches. Y'all well, yeah. So just is there anybody else out there, Coach, that you coach with that people might not know, but, man, they were a great football coach? Uh, too many of the guys I coached with in the boneyard. So uh, <laughs> uh, my, 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 my era coach, cause I was, I was a fairly uh, middle-aged coach when I came in the NFL. I mean, you know, Jim Hannafin, you know, I had a lot of admiration for him. He was a little wacky, you know, but he was, he, he could get the players to play, you know, and, and sometimes that personality of a coach can get the players to play. You got to teach them enough. If, you, if your players are good enough and they had a lot of good ones when he was at St. Louis, but but uh, he he was he gave us O.J. Anderson. He became the MVP in the Super Bowls uh, yeah. against the against, uh, Tampa down in Tampa. So so uh, some sometimes players don't adhere to the coach's personality, you know. But uh, as I said to almost everybody I ever coached, almost everybody, uh, my my goal is not to be your buddy. And I said I don't really care. I do care, but it doesn't bother me what you think of me now or next week or next day. Because I as I always use that 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 say. I see more in you than you see in yourself. So I'm not going to rely on what you see. I'm going to rely on what I see in you that can come out. And I'm going to use whatever techniques or whatever work we have to do to try to get that out of you. That's my responsibility. I'd be, I'd be, be a phony if I didn't do that. I'd let you get by with things that you should. I, I wouldn't be coaching you. I'd be palling with you. I'm not doing that. And I said, if 10 years, 12 years from now, after you sign your third contract and you're making millions of dollars, then I care what you think about me. Man, Coach, we, we've done over an hour, Coach. I, I appreciate you coming on. Is there anything you would like to say to the high school coaches or the young coaches out there? Just a last little bit of advice, maybe something we didn't touch on that you'd like to talk about. Study, learn, go to clinics, see people that you admire, see people that are successful. Now, in high school, there, there are a few teams that can get a little thing going, but in high school, they graduate, you know, so somebody wins the state championship next year, they fire the coach because he lost all of his good players, you know, 
So, so they, they don't do that in, in the NFL. It's been a long time since I was only a short period of time a high school coach. But but your your turnover in personnel in high school is really you got to be coaching those young guys. The guys we we're talking about were number twos or maybe even number threes. You better be developing them if you want to keep your job and be honorable to them. So so I would say to the high school coaches, don't just coach that guy that's a great player and hang around and get your picture made with an arm around his shoulder. He doesn't need you as much as that guy that's a third teamer that can't walk and chew bubble gum. You know, he's he's going he's he's a, a, a overweight, short kind of squatty, uh, 13, 14 year old right now. When he gets to be a 17-year-old, you're going to be responsible for him. So you better start early because he's not as good as that guy you got your arm around out there on the practice field so they take your picture with him and put it in the paper. So the the, the thing, a, a lot of coaches don't want – they don't want to work with players that, that aren't uh, – Tom Olivadotti told me one time <laughs> when we were at the Redskins, you know, he was John Shula's defensive coordinator for a lot of years. And I'd stay out there for 30 minutes after practice sometimes just throwing balls to anybody, receivers, tight ends, defensive backs, anybody that wants to stay and catch. I, I, I throw all kinds. Of, never threw one right in their chest, though. But I just throw to anybody that was interested. So th- that that's a kind of commitment a high school coach. Just just because they say you're only supposed to practice an hour and a half, you know, use that time wisely. But after practice doesn't count because <laughs> you're not you're not killing them. You know, uh, you you tell, you tell a swimmer that works all day swimming, you tell him not to not to go swimming on his day off. If he wants to go swimming, he's not hurting him. You're not hurting him. But you know you don't want to abuse their time, you know. I mean, I'm not saying that. Don't just stay out there and do foolish things. But things that will develop their skill, help them to be better players for what you're asking them to do. You need to teach them and help them become that person. And that Amen. takes time. That takes time. So I would say to high school coaches, back to your question. Uh, back, I would say always keep somebody. It doesn't have to be you as a head coach because the head coach is, is, has got a lot of responsibility. And uh, and but have your coaches. Don't don't let them just run off the practice field as soon as practice is over. Even if it even if they take five minutes and you're teaching three techniques, t- show show them again and again and again and again how to play a reach block. You know how 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 to get an arm over on a pass rush. Take take some technique every day and and help them with that. And if it's five minutes or if it's ten minutes, but you don't you can do that in a phone booth. You know you don't have to you don't have to kill them running up and down the field on it jumping through ropes and all that kind of stuff. That doesn't make them a better technique player. You got to do you got to do technique worker te- technique work almost in a phone booth. It's got to be that close quarter, you know, so that they, so that they can feel the block. Have them work against each other. You, know, you say, well, I only got five players. Well, you got two working against two others, and the other guys rotating in there. You know, so don't don't do. I, when, when I was at Ole Miss as a college coach, I went down into Delta, Mississippi, to a school down there. The high school the, the, the high school coach was so big and so overweight, he had to sit on a bar stool to coach. I mean, he was, he was, he was Mount Vesuvius. I'm telling you. So uh, he had one guy doing something and one other guy to two some one other guy and the rest of them were standing and watching. I mean, I almost jumped into Mississippi river. I mean, that, that, that is, that is such a horrendous waste of time. Don't let them stand and watch. If they want to stand and watch, tell them to become fans or help them to become fans. Get the guys moving, get them moving, get them moving, get them. You don't have to kill them, but keep them moving. Working on individual phone booth type things, you know, the first step of a back, the first step read of a linebacker, you know, what is what is he reading? Is he reading the guard back combination? We'll put one of your players at guard and put one one, one over there to running to, to the linebacker, and you stand back there and have them do something. So they're all moving. They they don't have to be human dummies, but they have to be person impersonators. You know, let them impersonate the other team. If 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 if, if, if you're coaching a release technique. You know, they can go release on each other, just standing in that phone booth, just go and release, you know. So keep them moving. That's what I would say. Keep them moving. Don't let them stand and watch. Don't get in lines and let five guys go on five guys and the other 35 or 40 guys are standing there and watching. Have them all. Take the whole field. Have them all going at the same time. You say, well, they're not getting individual technique. Well, you got coaches out there. Have them move around. Move around. Don't work on 10 techniques. Work on two. One, one for 10 minutes, another one for 10 minutes. That's 20 minutes of your life. It's a long life. So, 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 ha- but have them working against each other, have them moving, 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 moving all the time. I first went to, first went to Cowboys. We had 15 individual. We did 12 drills in 15 minutes. Wow. Just moving fast as you can go. You can't, you can't coach football at the speed it's played. You can't, you can't. That I'll be, that I'll be laying out there in like a, like a, 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 a attack or something. But you can do the individual close order phone booth type thing. You can do those for a long time and nobody gets hurt and nobody gets worn out. But when they, when you take those parts 
and build to the whole. Now, some coaches over the years have been very successful coaching the whole down to the parts. Now, that, that makes me nauseated because you're coaching backwards. Because while they're going from the whole, they're going to have bad days, discouraging days, inefficient days to get down to the, what you wanted to start out with. You can't build a house building a roof first. You know, you got to build from the ground up. And when you do that and they start putting these things together, they can start to have some success. And when you coach the whole down to the parts, there are no areas of success until you get to where you're going backwards. You're going to the beginning from the end. So you, you build, build blocks. And that's, that's not revolutionary. You know, that was probably true in Pythagoras McNally's days. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but you, you start, and that's when they can start feeling some success, you know, when they see that this, what this coach is telling me over and over and over again is a way to do it. And it's like a, a little bit like a golf swing. You know, if you tell a guy to do 15 things on one golf swing, he can't do anything. So you got, you got to minimize it to what he can do, what he can understand and then what he can succeed with. Yes, sir. I appreciate you coming on coach. I'm going to press end here. We'll talk a little bit. Um, once it's over with it. Thank you, coach. That, does that does that mean I'm expired? Does that mean this 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 uh, uh, cast is fired? Uh, no, nah, coach. I I just appreciate you coming on, coach. Yeah, I'm well, thank you. I, I, I've had a lot of a lot of friends in football. I learned from a lot of people, and they haven't all been head coaches, you know. And but uh, I appreciate everybody's had a, had a walk in my life along the way. If I hadn't gone to college and played football, I'd be doffing on the third shift at Minetta Mills in Monroe, North Carolina, and I'd be <laughs> bent over like this from reaching down that bottom, putting those stools on the on the cotton mill, uh, in the cotton mill. So I had a lot of help along the way. And I, 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 I never have believed that it was who you were. It's what you are, you know, cause there's a lot of who's in football, but there's not very many what's what is somebody that's established a reputation and other people want to learn from who is a guy that you just glad to, glad to be seen in a picture with, you know, so it's not <laughs> about the who's it's about the what's it's and you were a what coach and coaching now he's a what. Right. I, I, well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, you. I, I always felt like an, uh, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a roastful person, but you know, I think somebody attributed this to Abe Lincoln may not have been him, but uh, you can fool all the people some of the time and some of the people all the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. But I dispel that. Amen. I fooled all the people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Coach. Take care.